This is 22 News in Focus. Good Sunday afternoon. Welcome to 22 News in Focus. I'm Tamara Sakarzik. In just a few weeks, students will be heading back to school. For some local districts, of course, that means tens of thousands of students will be starting the school year. This can be challenging for some students. Today on 22 News in Focus, we'll discuss the various issues that students can face and how parents can help their children get through them. Paul Mina is the president and chief executive officer for the United Way of Pioneer Valley. He's joining me today to talk about some of these issues. Now, Paul, you your organization really does a lot for uh, students, including the backpack program. So they provide backpacks to homeless students and students in need. How did this program start and how does it help the community? Well, initially um, it was a regular backpack program like other organizations run um, that was for any child in need going back to school. But then we found uh, through working with the school system that in Springfield that um, there was a tremendous need of uh, assistance for kids who were homeless and I know that's hard for people to believe that we have children within the school system who actually do not go home to their own house at night uh, but there are over 2200 of them in in the in the area and these are kids that uh, fall under the McKinney Vento federal program so we're able to work with the school systems to determine which children are homeless without creating any stigma right. and then we find out what they need age appropriately and they get wonderful backpacks to go back to school with just like every other kid and uh, they don't know where these things came from uh, it's a very um, uh, low-key uh, distribution there's no big fanfare it's just done anonymously and these kids get to go back to school with the tools for school that they need to learn and be prepared so they can succeed in the next school year, just like everybody else. That's crazy to think about. I mean, talk about anxiety in and of itself of going back to school and not being able to personally afford a backpack. If people yeah. at home would like to help with this program, is there a way to donate these backpacks? Oh, yeah. Are you still taking them? Well, it's very nice of you to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the, way, the best way to do it is to go on to our website at www.uwpv.org and just go to the uh, uh, backpack program uh, link and you'll go, there's all the information is there including what we need to have donated for the backpacks. People can donate money, they can donate the products that go inside, they can donate the backpacks, they can come and volunteer. There's a myriad of things that they can do and our big sponsor for this program besides the city of uh, Springfield and Peter Pan bus uh, really is the whole business community. They've all wrapped around this whole project and we've got tons of people that are going to help us to fill that big beautiful green Peter Pan bus and uh, it's going to be brought to the school systems. Uh, we, we're going to be doing this with three systems this year, over 2200 kids and uh, like I said it'll be done totally anonymously. The school personnel will pass these out to the kids when they come back to school and they won't even know where they came from. What feedback have you guys gotten about this program from just the students reacting to it? We um, anecdotally have gotten some fantastic responses. Uh, crying, tears, uh, parents uh, being, you know, just totally blown away by what their kids received from somebody that doesn't even know their name. They just wanted to help them. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that. Uh, uh, United Way has a society of giving called the Alexis de Tocqueville Society and it's uh, made up of individuals who give ten thousand dollars a year to the United Way to help people in need or more and it was named after a French traveler and explorer named Alexis de Tocqueville and he went around the world chronicling the behaviors of people and how they worked in in their communities and when he came to America back in the 1800s he could not believe the kind of charitable things that he saw. In fact, he wrote that, this is a loose uh, quotation, but he, he said, these Americans, they do things for other people without any expectation of getting anything in return. This is something that I have not found in my travels elsewhere. And it's, it's, it holds true today. None of these folks that are giving to these kids today know these kids. They have no idea who they are. They're never going to know who they are. They're just doing it because they know that it was something important that had to be done. And that's what we do in this country. That's what we do in this community. We help people in need. And uh, so it's, it's, an, it's a good thing. 
Yeah, and like you said, thing. a powerful impact. Uh, other than backpacks, are there any other school supplies that children need? I mean, I know that teachers especially end up buying a lot of the supplies themselves or some schools supply what they need, but mm. pens, pencils, is there anything else that you guys collect? Oh, there's a, when you see the website, there's more than pens and pencils. There's tons of stuff that kids today need in their backpacks, but we don't focus on the other things. We, we focus specifically on the child's needs okay. going back, but the schools have needs as well, and I'm sure that uh, we we can get that information for you, maybe post it on your website. I also know that a lot of schools in this area specifically require students to wear uniforms, but right. uniforms can be very expensive. Right. So how do you get around something like that? Is I'm assuming that's something that you guys also help with? Well, we, we don't help with uniforms in particular, but what we do do is we provide through the social workers at the school any child that can't afford something that he needs or she needs to go back to school like any other kid. Uh, we very, very, very anon anonymously will help with that. And, um, you know, a lot of the things that we do, nobody ever knows. And it's on purpose, not by accident. So uh, if there are anybody out there who knows of children who have uh, needs in that regard that are not being met, you just call me directly at United Way and we'll take care of it. What other programs do you guys have at United Way? Because I know you do do a lot with the youth mm -hmm. here in Western Mass. Well, we're the largest provider of after school care. Uh, in, in the region. We provide the funding for boys, all the Boys and Girls Clubs, the Ys, uh, the Youth Centers, uh, Girls Inc., other organizations in the region that uh, depend on our funding for sustainability. Uh, we're also the, uh, last year we provided 241,000 hot meals to families in need through our network of food pantries and congregate meal programs. Um, you know, we um, and we have another thing that people don't really realize is associated with United Way, but we run and operate Massachusetts 211. 211 is the three digit number, just like 911, that you can call anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we answer the phone in 140 languages, and it is free to the public. And they can ask questions about anything in human services that they need. And we'll provide them with the information, we'll direct them in the right place. We'll help follow up with them to make sure that they get the right information the first time. And we also have a mental health suicide prevention line built into Mass 211. It's called Call to Talk. And um, that's a number where you can call the same time, anytime, day or night, 24 7, and get to talk to a person who is trained to listen to people who have mental health issues. And if we find that there's somebody that's going to hurt themselves or uh, they are exhibiting uh, behavior that is disturbing or be c is concerning to hurt themselves or somebody else. We have a protocol in place where we do a warm handoff and make sure that we are talking to the person while the authorities and emergency personnel get to them before they jump off a bridge, God forbid, or do something else. So uh, we have a very uh, robust network. Tons of people from the Pioneer Valley call that number every day. And I bet you most people don't realize that it's all because of United Way. Yeah, you're probably right. And I know that you said a lot of the great things that you guys do as a result of businesses that you partner with. So if any business owners are out there watching this and they'd like to get involved, how can they go about doing that? Just just go to our website, pick up the phone number, or you can call me anytime. 508-561-5811 is my cell number. We love people to call us and give us money and help us with <laughs> volunteerism. You know, none of this can be done without people's generosity. Right. This doesn't get done because of good wishes. You know, nobody helps anybody with just good intentions. You have to have the resources to be able to help people. And this area is so generous. The companies, the individuals, um, the organizations, our partners, our stakeholders, they're just so generous and they're so loyal to this region. We're very lucky to have a, an area like that. Not all places in our country are like that. This is a very, very generous area very parochial, people love their region, they love their communities, and they're willing to help people in need. And that's a very good thing. You know, from the mayor all the way down to every company in this region, uh, we have tremendous support, and we're very, very proud of that, and we're very grateful for all the corporate support that we get. And just to kind of draw a picture for people at home, I know you said, I believe there were three cities or towns in Western Massachusetts that these backpacks are going to this mm -hmm. year. Can you tell us which ones those are? 
no. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, because I it's. <laughs> I, you know, I was going to say, wait, is it we, private? We, uh, I <laughs> well, no. It's, it's, we there's they're on the website. You can okay. see them there. I don't want to misspeak uh, because we have 25 communities gotcha. that we deal with, and we're giving uh, support to numerous ones, small amounts, and then there's three that are actually getting significant support. Springfield being the the largest one because the system is the largest system. Right. Uh, but um, you know, I I just. Uh, I think that people need to realize that, um, you know, they can become a significant other in the lives of other people by just picking up the phone, making a pledge, sending in a check, volunteering. If you don't have money, you can volunteer your time, and uh, it's just as good as the money. So, uh, you know, whatever anybody can do, we're greatly appreciative, and we appreciate the TV station here, you know, giving us this time to, to really tell the story and to evangelize about the things that we do to help people in need. All right. Well, thank you, Paul, for talking to us about this thank today you. and informing everybody at home. If you want to learn more about the United Way of Pioneer Valley, we've posted a link to our website at WWLP.com. It's also important for parents to prepare their children to go back to school, so we'll discuss the best ways to do that right after the break. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about back to school planning and preparations from bedtime routines to getting the necessary vaccinations. Back to school can be a busy time for parents and students. Dr. Mark Starr is a pediatrician with Trinity Health of New England and Maria Zygmunt is the director of the Brightside Family Stabilization Team. They're joining me today to talk about the health and well-being of students. So of course every parent at home knows about the whole vaccination uh, list that you really need to fulfill before you can go back to school. What are some of the top vaccinations that every student needs to get for public schools? Uh, the uh, uh, state of uh, Massachusetts has uh, certain requirements for going back to school as far as immunizations, and those would include uh, whooping cough and tetanus, uh, polio, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, chicken pox, and hepatitis B. Uh, we do have other vaccines that we offer the kids to that are important. Uh, those would include uh, for meningitis would be haemophilus and uh, pneumococcal meningitis, um, as well as a vaccine we give to little guys for uh, vomiting and diarrhea illness called rotavirus. Um, and then there's the foodborne illness, uh, hepatitis A. Um, later on for the teenagers, we do have some uh, an additional uh, meningitis vaccine. And uh, there's also a vaccine uh, to, uh, meant to prevent cancer. Uh, the uh, HPV vaccine, a human papillomavirus. All right, so we just discussed a lot of vaccines <laughs> in a small amount of time. So are these things that your doctors typically tell you about before you go back to school? Or are these things that parents should know about already? Uh, uh, these are things we discuss at each of the well checkups when we see the parents. Um, the well checkups are um, established by the health department, the CDC, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. And so we follow those guidelines for uh, the ages at which we see the kids and then and when we off offer those vaccines. Uh, but uh, uh, the well checkups are an important time for us to discuss not just the vaccines, but also other things like developmental issues, um, uh, other health related questions that the parents frequently have about feedings, uh, sleeping, um, things that seem pretty simple to us as adults, but even peeing <laughs> and pooping are really important for parents of little people. Um, and that, it, the well checkups are a great opportunity to discuss those issues as well as the vaccines. So talking about the issue of sleeping, I know that this can be a challenging time in the summer because it's light outside for longer, kids stay up later because they don't have school the next day. So when should you start getting back into that routine of kind of getting up early, going to bed early, and how long does it take your body to adjust? Well, I would think that given that there's three weeks left before going back to school, this is actually a very good time for parents to start thinking about that and start to talk to their children about routines and depending upon the age of the child, you know, looking at what's the appropriate time for that child to start getting ready for bed, 
I think routines are the most important that parents need to put into place, particularly for younger children, um, whether that's starting off with a bath routine and then moving into maybe reading a storybook, maybe singing to them, something along that line. And as long as it's a routine for the kids, even maybe picking out their outfits for the next, the next day for school for your older child, um, talking to your child about how their homework is or any concerns that they have, again, for that older child. Um, making sure that the child feels that they have that special time maybe right before going to bed with that parent to really talk about some anxieties or fears that they may have about the next day. If your child isn't sleeping around this time when it's, you know, just a few weeks before you go back to school, do you think that's something that could be related to anxiety? Is that something that parents might want to um, explore further? Absolutely. So it's hard for a kid because they're, most children don't have much of a structure and from the time they get out of school to, to this time now. So it is hard for a child to get adjusted. So parents starting to talk about school and helping them to understand why you have to go to bed a little bit earlier. And at this point in time, you know, they could even just start backing it up maybe like a half hour at a time. So if their child is normally going to bed at 10 o'clock, maybe they start doing 9.30 for three or four days and then maybe they back it up to 9 o'clock, you know, until they get to what the appropriate age level would be for bedtime. Kind of weaning off those weaning late off night that. hours. Yes, yes. <laughs> when it comes to uh, food, I know that that's something that also changes in the summer because usually when your sleep changes, the amount of time that you spend eating or the time that you do eat also changes. So how should parents help their children adjust to the fact that this is now structured? In a few weeks, it'll be your breakfast, then your lunch, then you go home and do whatever when that happens. And I think that's a really important question to ask because um, kids oftentimes are eating on the run during the summer. And so families have to start thinking again about routines for that as well. So if you know that you want your child to start waking up a little bit earlier to get them ready for school, maybe they're getting up now at maybe 9, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Again, you want to start waking your child up a little earlier and having them have a breakfast because breakfast is like one of the most important meals for a child to have before they're going to school. And again, having a, a structure for the time of lunch and proper snacks as well, and then having your, your nighttime meal together, um, and then having maybe a snack before going to bed is all, always very appropriate for children for proper nutrition. And speaking of food, I always remember back when I was in school kind of hitting that slump in the afternoon, and it's probably because I wasn't fueling my body with the mm -hmm. right food. So what's the best type of food or foods to eat for breakfast and then for lunch and then for any snacks throughout the day? Well, uh, uh, traditionally, the uh, breakfast foods are, would include things like eggs or toast, um, yogurt, fruits, um, dry cereals that aren't too sugary, uh, things that will stick with you as you go through the course of the day. Um, in general, um, trying to uh, increase the number of proteins and try to minimize the sugary carbohydrates um, that uh, the child who would be on a sugar high for a few hours into the school day but then crashes and burns a little <laughs> later on is probably not the best uh, best outcome for that child so uh, anything that um, is maybe more high in protein or fruits um, and yogurts dairy products things of that sort would definitely be very reasonable for a breakfast food and if your child is playing sports or has an outdoor activity, is there a different way to space out when to snack or what to eat? Um, it's not unreasonable for the kids to bring along some snacks from home, especially if the school uh, isn't in a position to provide those. It's uh, Commonly the parents will tell me that they might hand their kids uh, granola bars or headed out the door to slip into their pocket that they can eat later. Um, water is also important. Um, if you have a reusable uh, water container that you can bring to school uh, with an appropriate amount of water, uh, that's still far better than a uh, juice box or soda. Uh, so healthy snacks, uh, things that uh, will survive the course of the day without being refrigerated, uh, is certainly important. Yeah, it's definitely a good idea when it's talking back to school. Um, as for germs, this is usually a concern for parents, especially when it's back to school. What are the best ways for parents to prevent their children from getting sick? Uh, well, there are uh, some of the universal uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, the CDC recommends. Uh, in cold and flu season, one of the uh, key features is if you're going to cough or sneeze, uh, try and cough into your <laughs> elbow. <Please. laughs> uh, bring along some tissues. 
uh, it, it's not always easy to uh, go to the bathroom to wash your hands, so there are um, hand sanitizers that don't require water. Uh, it, uh, don't share drinks, because some of the illnesses that are spread in schools are spread by saliva. Uh, but uh, in addition to that would be making sure a child is fully immunized, um, especially as we get closer to um, our flu immunization season uh, in, when we receive our stocks in September and October, uh, contacting your child's uh, primary care office to ask for the flu vaccine. All right, so all very important information for parents who are getting their kids ready to go back to school. For some students, going back to school can cause anxiety and stress. So we'll learn about ways to help your child adapt when we return. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about preparing your children to get back to school. Many students suffer from anxiety, which can cause a lot of stress this time of year. And I know that some of these stressors can be things that are happening in a child's household that then kind of go back to school with them. Do you have any advice for parents if they're maybe going through a divorce or have other type of stress at home on how to make sure their children don't bring that to school with them? Anxiety is one of the number one things that we see with students um, from whether they're in elementary school right up through college. So, and I think for parents to talk about that with the child and kind of normalize it with a child and letting them know that everyone feels some source of some s small amount of anxiety and that's okay is going to really help a child to be able to come to the parent and talk to the parent. And I think also telling your child that if you're not comfortable when talking with mommy or daddy, then there's always people that are within the school systems. There's adjustment counselors, there's guidance counselors, there's teachers, there's coaches. So there's always somebody that I think can be very important for that particular child outside of just their peer group. How do you think parents should let their children know that there are these other people? If, like, what are the symptoms, I guess, of anxiety? And if the parent feels like they're not really talking to them about it, but they should be talking to someone, how do you approach that conversation? What we'll see frequently is that the child is going to have symptoms of not wanting to go to school. They're going to be talking about stomach aches or headaches. You actually might see your child shaking a little bit. So those are some of the common symptoms that we do see with kids. What are some of the biggest stressors for children? I'm sure it's different for each age group, so let's start with elementary school students. Elementary, um, the biggest one is separation from parents. You know, if mm -hmm. your child hasn't been in preschool situations and this might be their first time going in, um, being able to be comfortable and being able to trust somebody that's outside of your mom or your dad is a big one for them. Um, for going into middle school, there's a huge transition there for children because they've heard from other children usually about the amount of homework that they <laughs> may get. Uh, the changing of classrooms might be the first time for some middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. um, not knowing how to work with more than one teacher, so all of those things. Um, peer pressure is also huge in, in your middle school and, and wanting to be like your, your best friend or even friendships switching and changing at that point in time as interest starts to change and different sports activities become available you know, for the students. Um, so those can cause some level of anxiety. When is a good time for parents to start addressing peer pressure? Because like you just said, it's not something that you just experience when you get to high school and you're all of a sudden exposed to alcohol and drugs for the first time. This is something that can happen way earlier Absolutely. on. Absolutely, yes. Um, peer pressure can start right from the very beginning. So even uh, five and six year olds will feel a sense of peer pressure <laughs> and it gets worse as the child gets older. Um, they want to have either the same kinds of clothing or the same hairdos or the same sneakers. Mm -hmm. So you have some of that kind of stuff that's going on and it's going to be difficult with, with, with the families that have different economic factors that also to go and try to go out and purchase those types of things when maybe the next door neighbor is, is wearing a fancy pair of sneakers and you can't afford to do so. Um, and that can cause a lot of anxiety for, for your middle age children and your elementary children as well. When it comes to that, not being able to afford things and kind of feeling uh, stressed out or anxious about that, how should parents approach that conversation? Because that can also be tough for parents to explain, we don't have the same amount of money as these other people, I can't pay for that, but you shouldn't feel bad about yourself. I think talking to the child about your strengths that you have, 
um, in who you are and who's your identity is helpful for a child. So maybe your child is very talented and, and maybe they're in drawing or maybe they can sing or maybe they're into football um, and trying to get that child encouraged to play those types of different sports for them to feel good about themselves. So it's not about the material things that they own but who they are as an individual. I know that making friends can also be challenging for kids and that's you know across the board whether we're talking about five-year-olds or 20-year-olds for that matter. So what advice would you give parents to have them I guess make sure they're interacting with other students in a way that is leaning towards making friends especially when they're younger? One of the things that's really important for parents to do is to get to involved with the school get to know the school system, um, find out what kind of sports activity, what, what kind of special events that your child clubs, things that your, the school system may be offering, um, after school programs. So things along that line that your child can, can become a part of um, is going to help them with that in, in gathering friendships. Um, sometimes schools will even have social groups and so the parent can talk to the adjustment counselor and ask the adjustment counselor, is there a social group that you guys are having? And the child can participate in that as well. If your child isn't making friends, that can be I'm sure just as hard on the parent as the child. What should you do in that situation? Should you start exploring out of school activities like dancing, gymnastics, things Absolutely. like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those types of things are also important for families to be able to have access to um, because sometimes there may not be an activity such as dancing within the school system, but it would be something that they could do outside of the school system. And how about uh, bullying? When it comes to that, I'm sure that's one of the biggest anxiety factors for children nowadays. So how can you tell that your child is being bullied and how do you address it? I would speak to my child and find out what's going on for the child. Um, and then if it's something that you feel like as a parent you would need to go to the school system. Schools are very involved with that. It's something that they don't tolerate. Um, so working closely with the school to figure out what's actually happening in that situation is very helpful. I want to go back to when we were talking about elementary school students and kind of leaving their parents for the first time because I'm sure that this can also be an anxious experience for some parents that are like, wait, no, you've been home with me all of your life. So have you ever gotten questions from parents about how they should cope with that? Well, one of the things that we always talk to the parents about is the fact that if they are showing anxiety, then their child is more than likely going to pick that up because kids are very sensitive. So as a parent, you want to show your child that you believe in them, you believe in the school system, you believe in their strengths as a child, and encourage them and let them know that you're going to be okay. You know, mom's going to be here, dad's going to be here when you get home from school, or whoever the sitter's going to be, you know, when that child gets home. Talk to them about them. Let them know who's going to be picking them up. Talk to them about what's going to happen after school. So you're going to have a really great school day today, and tonight we're going to go out and we're going to go to for a walk with the family. Um, so something very positive the child can look forward to. How important do you think it is for parents to talk to their children once the school day is over and they're back home to kind of get on the same page of what's happening at school and keep up with what's happening at school? It's very important. Um, I think a parent needs to spend at least 15 minutes a night talking to the child about w how their day went. Um, it, I think sometimes when kids get home, parents get home, things are very busy with trying to, to get through the nighttime routines. And, but spending that extra 15 minutes with that child, particularly right before bedtime, might be a really helpful time and be part of that routine. So the child knows that mom and dad are invested into whatever the situation is that's happening at school and they're going to be there to help them. Right, very important Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Um, as for students that are stressed out or dealing with anxiety, when do you think it's time to seek professional help and not just help within the school? Oh, well, a lot of times we're looking for changes in the way the child is functioning on a daily basis. Uh, are they able to um, play with their friends? Are they able to uh, actually go to school? Uh, I've had some of the kids who um, absolutely refused to go into school because they were so anxious. And um, in those occasions, it's, it's important to seek out extra help for those kids and uh, help for the parents who are, who are dealing with those kids as well. Um, so it's uh, looking for um, some subtle signs. For the older kids, it might be uh, behavior changes where they're 
just not interacting as well, not just with their families, but with other friends and, and the teachers and the school staff. Um, but uh, and in, in many cases, the, that help is available in the community uh, the, um, with the help of uh, agencies like Brightside or others and uh, their primary care providers in the office. They can usually steer them toward the right help. All right, perfect. All great information for everybody watching at home. There are many resources available for parents and students to make sure that back to school transition goes as smoothly and easily as possible. We'll talk about those in just a couple of minutes. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about back to school planning and preparations. Many schools offer resources to help your kids transition back into the school year. I'm joined right now by West Springfield Superintendent Michael Richard and Pete Gillen, the principal of West Springfield Middle School, who are here with me to talk about some of this. So let's talk about the school year starting. What does this mean for West Springfield? How is the school system getting ready? Oh boy, we've spent the entire summer uh, getting ready. <laughs> we haven't for, stopped. <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't stop, and that's the the beauty of working in the schools is we're always uh, actively working to make sure that we're we're improving and being prepared for students to come back. But the students will be coming back to us in, in three weeks, or uh, just at the end of August, and and we're ramped up. We've been spending the summer doing professional development, getting teachers involved in professional development, and making sure that. Uh, working with our, our buildings and grounds that schools are ready and operational on, on August 29th. All right, and I know that uh, West Springfield has a lot of students, right? How many students? We've got about 4,300 students across the district, so quite a number, not quite what Springfield has, uh, as we heard earlier from uh, United Way, but we still have a, a fair number of kids that are anxious for school. All right, and it, as you just mentioned, we've been talking a lot about anxiety so far and the anxiety of going back to school. How do you guys as administrators and the teachers help prepare to address students' anxieties? Uh, I think that Mr. Gillen at the middle school deals with a lot of that. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, transitions of any kind can be difficult, especially for young folks, and certainly the middle school level where in West Springfield, five uh, neighborhood elementary schools are coming together for the first time oh, wow. at our middle school in grade six. So we're well aware of the need to support students uh, as that transition can be anxious. And so the way that we do that is by trying to make school exciting, by welcoming students back with energy, with enthusiasm, and with an eye on, uh, on personalize, personalizing. As you heard uh, Mr. Richard say, we're a big district, but that doesn't mean we can't um, be in tune to the personal needs of students. We've got uh, a wide range of different types of student in West Springfield and our staff really prepares on how do we make the experience unique, how do we make the, the experience address their particular needs so that way we can use our resources to support, support students and uh, I'd say that we're pretty well versed and, and prepared to do that um, thanks to the, to the great preparation that we take over the summer months. Uh, I'd imagine that for the students who have learning disabilities, going back to school, especially like you said, when you're combining all those mm -hmm. schools and starting middle school, that can probably be a very anxious time. So how should parents help kind of address the anxiety that students may have if they do have a learning disability? I would say the, the first piece would be uh, coming uh, organized to school, um, making sure that they control what they can control. Um, and so that means being prepared, being well rested, um, and then looking for something that may be out of the ordinary or off pattern is a great way for any parent, uh, especially parents of those with disabilities, to get in tune with, is there something out of the ordinary that I should be questioning? As you, if you see a change in pattern, whether that's behavioral or whether it's academic or whether it's social emotional, that's a good signal that the time to pick up the phone or send an email uh, might have come around. And, and, um, and simply doing that, you know, reaching out to the point person at the school, whether it's an administrator or a counselor, uh, as you recognize and see those changes in pattern, um, I think that's an important first step for students, especially parents of anxious students looking for those little, um, little opportunities to reach out. And you mentioned staying organized, which is mm -hmm. incredibly important. How should parents help their children stay organized? Because this is something that comes naturally to some students, but other students are a hot mess when it's Absolutely. trying to organize things. I think that at all levels, a routine is important. And you know, the summer is an opportunity to throw routine out the window and have fun and, and be a child. Uh, but at this time of the year, it's, start, it's a time to start to think about what time are we going to bed, what time are we getting up, what kinds of things do we need in place, and establishing uh, some regularity to what happens to the day. Because even the most anxious student, if they, if they know what to expect on any given day, that's going to help ease those anxieties a little bit so that when they come to school, 
they know what to expect, they're prepared, and when they leave school, they know what they're going to expect. So any opportunity uh, for parents to work with their child, walk them through a typical day, visit a school in advance, uh, have an opportunity to set their minds at ease uh, is going to be helpful. If you are entering a new school, I know that this might be different for different school districts, but can you go and visit that school in advance? Is there something that you guys can set up and help the student kind of see this is what it'll be like? Absolutely. So in West Springfield, we pride ourselves on making sure that we give those opportunities and we, we provide a, a, a an orientation for kindergarten students before school begins and an orientation for gra first grade students uh, before uh, school officially begins for them to come in, meet the teacher, get a sense about what the building is like, but we always encourage families if you are truly anxious and if your child wants that additional experience uh, to contact the school and in most instances we're able to meet those needs and, and have a personal conversation give a personal tour and make sure that the families can be introduced to the school leadership if not the um, the particular teacher that that student will have Okay, I know that there's also a lot of anxiety that kind of surrounds getting to school so if you're riding a school bus or anything like that how do you think parents should make the decision of whether your child should take the bus or whether your child should walk? And I'm sure there's some concerns around both of those things. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. So there's obviously there's there's policy in each district about what uh, what those boundaries are, what the limitations are for whether you can or whether you're eligible to take a bus. And if you are. A lot of times it's a great opportunity to build uh, relationships with uh, neighborhood students and to feel comfortable because you're riding in on a bus with some friends. Uh, but there's nothing that says you have to do that. I think that every family needs to make the decision that's right for their child. So if, if you are within a busing um, zone and you're able to take the bus, great. If you're able to self-transport your child, that's great. Although, admittedly, we, we prefer uh, the fewer the cars that show up to a school in the morning, the easier it yeah. is for us to manage that. But, um, but it is a personal decision. And sometimes it, it, it changes during the, during the time of the year when the weather is good and we can walk, we do, or we take our bike or we scooter. And during the poor uh, climate times, then, then we take uh, transportation that the school provides. It's a much safer route. If your child hasn't signed up to take a bus yet, is it too late? Oh, it's never too late. Oh, uh, okay. So bus routes are established here in West Springfield. We uh, we post those routes and the, the bus stops on our website so parents can check to see where the nearest stop is. Uh, so it, it's not about signing up, it's about whether you're eligible or not and, uh, and we account for that. All right, and now I'd like to move on to talk about school security because I know mm -hmm. that's obviously an issue that's on every parent's mind. So as a district in West Springfield, what have you guys worked on to make sure that students are safe? So uh, we, we run building and district-wide crisis uh, drills, um, and we have crisis teams that are in place at each school. We also have district-wide uh, tabletop planning sessions that are run in conjunction with uh, the police department and the fire department and the health department. So we all come together, we drill, we talk about what, what is going to work, what might need some revision, and we make sure that everybody in each building is aware of those, uh, aware of those plans. Matter of fact, we've got our first session planned for the first week of school. Uh, and combine that with regular evacuation type drills that, that we do as part of uh, fire department regulations uh, to make sure that students know how to exit the building in case of emergency. But you know, Pete is, uh, you know, his school is an example of one that they, they run tabletop uh, sessions in their own buildings and bring their crisis teams together. And maybe you could talk about that a little yeah. bit. It's interesting, as Mr. Richard mentioned, that uh, you know, taking the, the district wide vision and planning and extending that down to particular schools, one of the pieces in doing that that we found uh, an area of weakness through that process was with our substitute teachers. Um, and so very early on, it was great that we have these district plans, and it was great that we that our students had practiced and our regular staff had practiced. But through practice, we were able to learn that we what's vital is that every single person knows what to do in an emergency situation. And had we been lapped, uh, lax in our practicing, we may not have, have gathered information. So now we're, uh, we're able to provide for all substitute teachers, for all folks that enter the building um, with a part of their substitute manual, what the plan is, what the different uh, codes are, what the different um, pieces mean so that way um, through that sort of practice bit each building is able to personalize it and we've been uh, pretty successful at doing that in West Springfield where every building has a different layout every building has a different door structure or security structure but uh, while district uh, the district has some common practices in terms of how parents buzz into school mm -hmm. and that sort of thing each building through that 
tabletop exercise and that district-wide planning has really been able to focus on what are our needs and what are our particular students needs based on the layout of our building or the staffing structure of a building so it's um it's been a pretty helpful exercise starting right from the top and extending uh, as far uh, as far down and through the district as to substitute teachers all right so it sounds like a lot being done to make sure students are safe we'll continue our conversation after the break you're watching 22 news in focus Today we've been talking about back to school planning and a lot of that planning involves what happens after school. So after school activities, sports, how can parents stay on top about they stay on top of this stuff and also learn about what's going on? Well, I think that uh, social media is, is maybe for <laughs> the, these days parents uh, top uh, go to uh, between Facebook or Twitter or uh, any other parent groups that might be set up individually depending on what district you're working in. There are so many things that happen in West Springfield from the youngest grades right up through high school. We've got Boys and Girls Club. We've got, uh, you know, uh, the after school um, karate. We were sending kids to uh, activities that are run by faculty and staff uh, at each building. Uh, and then, of course, when you get to high school, athletics is a huge piece of, of what we do. Uh, we post most of that stuff on our website, uh, but there's, there's obviously those, those networks that happen uh, through word of mouth as well as through social media that, that families can, can tap in to make sure they're, they're well informed. And you brought up a good point that a lot of schools nowadays do post this stuff online and on social media. So what are the other types of things that parents can find on the West Springfield School District website? Just about everything. We had a great opportunity in, in collaboration with the town of West Springfield to update our websites uh, for the schools to match that of the, the town resources. And so uh, while that process is still evolving, uh, there's all kinds of opportunities you can connect with um, with Power School so you can learn about your, your, your students' uh, uh, grades. You can find out about extracurriculars. There's great calendar features. In West Springfield, we also uh, recently adopted a mobile app. So, oh, wow. uh, so families are able to, you know, on the fly, uh, learn about uh, lunch menus, and they can find out about what sports activities are going on. So, a lot of opportunities to stay connected uh, anywhere you are. Are there, I'm sure, after school clubs, that kind of thing probably starts in middle school, right? Yeah, and in some cases even earlier. In West Springfield, we're quite fortunate to partner with the West Springfield Boys and Girls Club, where we have students who travel to the club after school. We have on-site club locations, including at the middle school, um, in addition to the, the myriad of drama and art. Uh, music, athletic uh, opportunities that, that begin even earlier than, than middle school, but certainly uh, continue in the middle school and extend up until high school as well. You know, uh, the CDC tells us that 60% uh, that of teen drug and alcohol use happens between the hours of 3 and 7 p.m. And so it's incumbent upon us as school leaders and district leaders to make sure that we've accounted for that time. And I think the, the reasoning behind that is pretty clear. And so for us to combat that, providing engaging opportunities after school is vital. And advertising that on our website or uh, our Twitter accounts or things of that sort um, help grow the word of mouth and, and extend that through through social media and through parent conversations as well. So uh, if, it's, if there's an interest out there, chances are the school affords that opportunity um, in those after school hours and I'd encourage parents to check out the district's website or their, their school's Twitter page to see what's available. And you bring up an interesting point about those specific hours being mm -hmm. an issue for kids to experiment with drugs and alcohol. Uh, what should parents know about, I guess, any programs that help students stay away from that stuff. Do you guys have any educational programs that I'm sure is required for students? Well, we certainly have a health curriculum uh, that we follow in West Springfield, but you know, West Springfield has been uh, the recipient of the Drug-Free Community Grant, which is a federal program, which is funneling a, a, an awful lot of money into West Springfield to help us to educate uh, families and keep kids uh, drug and alcohol free. And, uh, and we're, the work that we're doing through the CARE Coalition has been, has been great. And, uh, you know, even uh, we've got a film that's that's being uh, filmed uh, in in West Side over the next couple of weeks uh, about the Jack Jonah story, and uh, we're we're really excited about doing that uh, and getting uh, families from West Springfield involved in the casting of that. And I think it's going to be an exciting opportunity for so many. But uh, we we educate uh, and we want to make sure that families have opportunities to to learn more. And so if they go to our the West Springfield Public Schools website, there's links to the Care Coalition and other opportunities. But we start before school, we carry it through the school day, and we carry, we keep it going after school. And, and healthy children is, is one thing that we really focus our attentions on, including programs like Girls on the Run, which is a great opportunity for uh, 
uh, for our staff to work with interested girls to get them uh, learning how to participate in a, in a 5k race and uh, you know so they they train uh, for months and then they participate in that and it's they're so excited that they've been able to conquer what seems like such a great challenge at the beginning and in the end they're looking forward to a 10k and talking about uh, stress and anxiety again, something else that might stress parents out and students out, we already discussed the bus issue, but walking to school, the safety of that, do you guys have any advice for parents? I do. I think that, uh, that establishing a pattern is important. Uh, routine is important. So, you know, making sure that, uh, that a pattern of being visible, a pattern of uh, staying on sidewalks, a, a common departure time, an expected return time, uh, and expected communication practices between the student and between home are vital when students are walking to school and establishing those patterns right from day one that the expectation on the first day of school in terms of when you'll leave and when to return and how you'll communicate with home and, and the safety precautions that you'll take along the way I think are important for, for students and families um, as they make those walks to school. And something else that might cause some anxiety for students and especially parents is if it's a low income family and they have trouble affording things, especially meals at school. Is there a way that they can apply for assistance to kind of get help for this? So there, there is uh, opportunities and we, uh, we, we encourage families who uh, can apply for, for benefits to do that. Uh, through the state so so that we we can follow through with direct certification which makes it that transition of understanding who's on a free and reduced lunch um, to connect directly with our school system but most many of our schools uh, at this point are meals at no charge and so because of the demographic of those particular schools uh, but in the instances where uh, where you're not at one of those uh, identified schools then certainly applying for those benefits uh, will connect you directly with our school systems uh, food service and, and make that transition very easy and anonymous. All right, good to know. And I know we've been talking a lot about stressors and anxiety, so tell me about a few things that West Springfield is doing that you guys are excited about this year. <laughs> uh, I'm excited that uh, we've really branched out in terms of uh, some hands-on learning. You know, learning in West Springfield looks different than it did when I went to school even. It's a lot more active. It's a lot more engaging. Um, it's a lot more problem-solving base. You know, the, the days of uh, sit and retain and memorize uh, have passed. Um, contrary to popular belief in some instances, it really is a school is an exciting, engaging, invigorating place to be, and the activities match that. You know, West Springfield Middle School offers a, a robotics class. We offer a, a really robust civics and modern world engagement class. We offer foreign language. Uh, so the, the, the chance to expand and, and the chance to do um, what you need to do to prepare to be a 21st century citizen is already in place in our schools. Uh, the learning is active, the learning is engaging and, and energized and enthusiastic. And, um, and that really is the hallmark of not just West Springfield Public Schools, but I'd say public schools in general. That's what makes it so wonderful is that, is that energy, enthusiasm, and passion um, that you're going to find right from the first day. All right, so there's a lot to be excited about, not just nervous. We'll have the last word for you after the break. Stay with us. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today we've been talking about back to school preparations for both parents and students. That's our program for today. We want to thank our guests for joining us and thank you at home for watching. If you missed any of today's episode, you can watch it in full on our website at WWLP.com. From all of us here at 22 News, have a wonderful day. Bye.